Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we are grateful to be your people in your presence. We are grateful to be a family, a family that is bought and paid for by the very blood of Christ. We are grateful that we have a living and sure king and kingdom that is coming soon. And so as we join together and look at your word this morning, I pray that you would be in our midst, that you would convict and lead and guide and help us to worship you as we see uh, you more clearly in the examples in your word. And so, Lord, be in our midst. May you be glorified. May we be built up into Christ as we open your word together and live as your people. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. We are in Philippians 2. And if you have your Bibles, open to Philippians 2, starting in verse 19. If you can, let's stand together as I read the word. Um, <clears throat> the early church used to stand together as they listened to the word, as they re read the word together. So I think it's important to understand we're under the authority of God's living and active word as we read it. We want to hear what God says in his word. Starting in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by the news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. I, I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker, fellow soldier, and, and your, your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been very distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am even more eager to send him to you. Therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may not, I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. You may be seated. D.A. Carson, who's a prominent scholar, uh, biblical scholar, uh, wrote about his early, um, his early experience as an undergrad, and he and a friend decided to start an evangelical Bible study for those who didn't know Christ there in Canada. And so he kind of looked at it as a mission field. He said, well, we'll start this evangelical Bible study. We'll go through the Gospels. We'll, tell, we'll see who's interested. So he and his friend decided to invite three people because they said, Two of them probably won't show up, so we'll just have one, and we'll, be out, we'll outnumber them. <laughs> what ended up happening, all three came, and eventually they had 16 people. And they had 16 uh, young men who were college age that were studying the Bible, and he said quickly they ran out of their depth several times. And they had a friend who was a graduate student named Dave. And so often they would take their friends that were in the Bible study over to their friend Dave, who was more mature in the faith, and they would ask him questions and, and, and allow for Dave to answer the questions of these skeptics. Well, he recounts one day, he's taking two young men down the hill from McGill University in Canada there to this graduate student, Dave. They get there. Dave is obviously very, has a heavy workload and very busy, and yet he made coffee. He sat down with them. And he turns to the first student. He says, why have you come to me? The student replied along these lines. Well, you know, I've always been going to this Bible study, and I realize I should probably learn a little bit more about Christianity. 
I'd also like to learn something about Buddhism and Islam and other world religions. I, I, I'm sure that I could broaden my perspectives. And this period, while I'm in university, uh, seems like a good time to explore religions a little. If you can help me with some of this, I'd be grateful. Well, Dave stared at him for a few seconds and then said to him, I'm sorry, I don't have time for you. My jaw dropped. The student, thus addressed, was equally nonplussed and blurted out, I, I, I beg your pardon? Dave replied, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but I only have so much time, and I'm a graduate student with a heavy program myself. If you have a Adelante's interest, a, a dabbling interest in Christianity, I, I'm sure that there are people around who could spend lots of time and energy showing you the ropes and introduce you to some of those. I can give you some books. And when you're really interested in Christ, come back and see me again. But under the present circumstances, I don't have time. So he turned to the second student. Why did you come? After listening to the rebuff administered by the first, to the first student, the second student may have been a bit cat. <laughs> but he gamely plowed on. He said, I have come from what you people call a liberal home. We don't believe the way you do, but we have a good home, a happy home. My parents loved their children. They disciplined us. They set us a good example. They encouraged us to be courteous, honorable, hardworking. For the life of me, I can't see what you people think of yourselves as Christians that you're any better. Apart from the whole, a whole lot of abstract theology, what have you got that I haven't? This time, I kind of held my breath, Carson writes, to see what Dave would say. Once again, he stared Adam for a few seconds, and then he simply replied, watch me. I suppose my jaw dropped again. The student, whose name was Rick, said something like, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Dave answered, watch me. Come, live with me for a month, if you like. Be my guest. Watch what I do when I get up and when I go to bed. Watch when I'm on my own, when, what I use with my time, how I talk to people, what I value in. Um, Come with me wherever I go, and at the end of the month, you tell me if there's any difference. Rick did not take Dave up on his invitation, at least not in the exact terms that he put out. But he did get to know Dave better. And in due course, Rick became a Christian. He married a Christian woman, and the two of them became medical doctors practicing medicine and living out their faith, both in Canada and overseas. See, watch me. At the time when you hear that, you may think, that's very arrogant to say, watch me. But then you think of what Paul says. Paul says, follow my example as I follow who? As I follow Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, see, sober observation and reflection assures us that much Christian character is as much caught as it is taught. That is, it is picked up by constant association with mature Christians. Watch me is something that we all need to be aware of because the world is watching. See, there's another phrase in our culture that we think about, do what I say, not what I do. And many times people think that, but Paul doesn't. Paul says, watch me. So who are you watching? See, uh, D.A. Carson gives uh, numerous examples throughout uh, his introduction to this passage, and he says, you know, there's matters of prayer, language, lifestyle, what entertainment we watch. Much Christian character is constantly being viewed in, in the question of modeling. Modeling is big. It takes place all over the place. We look at people that we admire. We watch people that we admire. If it's a sports figure, you can say, oh, I wish I was like this person. But the reality is there is something bigger than sports. So, the question today is, can you say this to a non-believer? Watch me. See how I'm different. So whom should we follow? How, who are our models? See, the Word of God today challenges our lives, comes into contact with our lives to say that there should be a difference. We live in a world that emulates self-centered interests, right? We look around, we see people who are interested in self, that are out for self, you do you. We, we follow your heart. 
These are all phrases that our culture has bought into. The early church was no different because Rome was self-centered. Greek philosophy was self-centered. Even if you look at how the Jewish faith had developed, they were out for themselves. But yet, the gospel comes in transforming our perspective on how we look at things, who we watch, and how we live our lives. So today, the big idea is when we emulate gospel men, hope, love, and faith transforms us and hum humbly exalts Christ, right? Hope, love, and faith should be transforming us and humbly exalting Christ. So point one is when we emulate gospel men, hope is renewed. When we um, emulate gospel men, hope is renewed. We don't use that word emulate too much today, but emulate means to try to be like to be better, to, to look to, to someone as an example. And so here in this first section of 19, verse 19 through 24, we see an example, <clears throat> the example of Timothy. Timothy is, Paul calls him his son, his co-worker. He shows the mind of Christ. And this is, this is big because this is connected to the beginning of Philippians 2, right? Philippians 2, it begins with the example of who? The example of Christ who lived and died and rose again. The example of Christ who is God himself that becomes man and lives out the life that we should have lived that we can't live. We need Christ in every part of our lives. So the, the similarities here, if you look at verse 4 in chapter 2 of Philippians, he says, let each one of you look not only on your own interests, but also the interests of others. And then if you look at verse 21, it says, they seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, Timothy is living proof that Christ changes hearts and lives. Timothy is not seeking his own interests like the others are. Verse 7 says, Jesus emptied himself by taking on what? The form of a doulos, the form of a slave, a servant. The lowest of servants he takes on. And Timothy, as a son with a father, has dulio. It's the idea of he slaved along with me in the gospel. Timothy set aside his own preferences and goes church planting when it's not popular into the Roman heart of Philippi. What an amazing example that we see in the life of Timothy himself. We should love Timothy. We should look to bring up more Timothys in our midst. We should pray that God would give the next generation a Timothy-like spirit to see the gospel transform their friends and family, their hearts around them. See, sending Timothy, and, and, and the word Tim, Timothy actually means honors God. So Timothy is living out his name. He honors God. He's a third-generation Christian, so he has his Mother Eunice, his grandmother Lois, and he has a Greek father, so his father may, may have been a God-fearer, we don't know, but it doesn't seem like his father was instrumental in his teaching as his mother and his grandmother were. And then Paul finds him and gets the Macedonian call, and Timothy is instrumental as the gospel goes forward into Macedonia. He goes along with the apostle, and he says, whatever you need, I'm here for it. In Acts 16, it says, Paul came also to Derba and Lystra, and a disciple was there. His name was Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So his father obviously was not a believer, according to uh, Acts 16. Uh, he was well spoken of by the brothers in Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him, he circumcised him because of the Jews who were uh, in those places, for he knew his father was a Greek. So Timothy goes above and beyond to even pains to follow in Paul's footsteps. He says, okay, if this is going to take a barrier away from the gospel being proclaimed, then I'll, I'll do it. He's a fellow worker. Uh, he's a brother. He's a bond servant. Uh, Paul goes on and on about Timothy. He's a beloved and faithful child in the Lord in 1 Corinthians 4. He's a son, a co-equal in the Lord's work. See, Paul was confident that God was working, and he saw Timothy coming alongside him 
as a means that God brought this person at this time for this purpose to proclaim the gospel. And that's the reality. We live in a time and place that God has placed us to proclaim the gospel, and it was in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that vital union in Christ is essential to see the gospel go forward. It's not that the world outside there, outside us is so bad. It's our sin inside us, as Todd mentioned this morning during uh, worship. Our sin inside us should give us pause and constantly go back to the cross. We should be theologians of the cross, realizing that we never go beyond the cross. We need Christ every single day that we live. We need to look to Christ. We are hopeful in, we're confidently hopeful in Christ. So, are you living as sons and daughters in the gospel? Because Paul keeps going back to what it means to be in Christ in this book. In verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, we love in, Christ, in the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> in verse 24 here, he says, we ground our confidence in the Lord. In chapter 4.10, he says, we rejoice, uh, we find joy in the Lord, and we desire others to have joy in the Lord in verse 26 of chapter 1. See, joy in the Lord, being confident in the Lord. And then he goes on to say in verse 29 of chapter 2 here, he says he welcomes Christian leaders in the Lord. We're, we're, we're unified in the Lord. And we stand firm in the Lord, chapter 4, verse 1. So in the Lord is essential. It's, he keeps going back to in Christ, in the Lord, we have our confidence and we live confidently because of what Christ has already done for us. It's not because we are so good, it's because we serve an amazing Savior Amen. who changes hearts and lives. If we didn't have Christ working, we would kind of lose hope. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, I have hope in the Lord. I have confidence in the Lord because he is working. He's using Timothy. He uses people around us. How many of us can think to someone in our lives that God has used to disciple us? I can think of many people, but one, one example would be my dad. I think of my dad growing up, seeing his example, being in the, in the Word, challenging his congregation to look to the Word, and he said, you know what? If I'm wrong, show me from the Word. I think that should be all of our mentalities, that the Word is our guide, and that we go to the Word. We should be people of the Word, because it's the living and acting, uh, spirit-breathed Word of God Amen. that makes all the difference. So he goes on to say, I'm cheered, I, I, I'm happy by the good news being preached concerning uh, the news about you. He, he hears the good news of what's happening. He hears about what the, the, what the Philippians are doing. And Paul is encouraged. He's strengthened. We should see the gospel functioning daily in our midst. Mm -hmm. We should see the gospel functioning daily in our midst. I love this phrase by, the, by Tim Keller. He says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Do you believe that? We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. He said, yet... Yeah, at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Amen. So if that's true, we have a humble confidence, not a prideful confidence, a humble confidence in Christ. That causes our hearts to have confidence in what Christ has done. And in many ways, we should live every month as if humility is the soil which we breathe and live and have our being in. Because before the cross, there's no pride. We're all equal before the cross. We all humbly come before the cross, realizing that Timothy's mindset should be our mindset. His mindset is the same as Christ, and the gospel mindset needs to be what we think, how we live, what we do. We should look to serve others before ourselves. The gospel mindset of Christ needs to bring new hope to us in our hearts and our spirits. There's many times that we can watch the news and become disheartened. But what we really need is the gospel of grace. We need to open the word and realize that no matter what happens here, we have a Savior that has already conquered sin and death. 
that we live in light of his victory. So, you see this in uh, no one is like him. It, it literally means no one is equal of soul. So I think Paul looked at this, that he saw Timothy as someone that was modeled after who Christ is, and he holds him up as an example, saying this, this God is working in my son Timothy. He says, I want you to know, brothers, this is verse 12 of chapter 1, he said, I want you to know, brothers, that the things according to me have really served to advance the gospel. So he sees these things serving to advance the gospel. He says, I hope to send Timothy the things concerning to you. So he, he's saying that Timothy is part of this advancement of the gospel. We don't just get an ethereal, like, this is the message of the gospel. God has given us the gospel to proclaim to others around us. We're, we're not meant to keep it just to ourselves. Amen. If you have good news... You can't stop telling it, right? If you go see something amazing, you go to Niagara Falls. I, it's funny, people go to Niagara Falls. It was amazing. You know what's more amazing? Christ died for our sins and rose again. We should see that as our all in all. We should see that as the lifeblood of what we do and, and, and pray for open doors that we can share this with others. So Timothy shares this same heart and mind in Christ that Paul has. He's concerned primarily for the Philippians and those around him. In fact, he, that's the whole reason they send him to Paul. He's sent to Paul because and, and Paul sees Timothy as this son that helps him preach, not out of selfish rivalry like in verse 15 and 17 of chapter 1 that some were preaching the gospel out of, but Timothy's genuinely concerned for you. All others seek themselves, but Timothy's genuinely concerned. This is what our concern should be. We should be like Christ in that we should highlight lives that serve. And many of you, so many here, I've only been here a little bit, but we see Christ lived out. We see how you serve each other. And that is exciting to see God at work in and through his church. That we see the good news go forward because people are serving and putting others' interests above their own. So Timothy's like a child with a father, and, and he, we want to see multi-generations come to know faith in Christ. We want to see people who we don't even know right now that God knows of come to know Jesus as a Savior because he is worth everything. We want to see Christ high and lifted up. And so Timothy did that. He lived as a slave to proclaim Christ as the Lord. He lived lowly. And we, I would love to see the next generation raised up to love Christ even more than us. That we would see more missionary impulse to go overseas, to preach the gospel, to share the good news of Christ with those who have little to nothing, and to preach the gospel here, as many, I think, in our culture don't see a need for the gospel, but yet they struggle. And so we know that Christ is more powerful than any struggle, and we want to serve the community. We want to share the love of Christ with the community to make much of Christ. The father and son imagery is very important in the ancient times, if you think about it, because the father and son, the son would see what the father would do, and he would learn from his father, right? So just like a, if you had a farmer, he would learn how to farm based on how his father farmed. Uh, if you had a, a blacksmith, he would learn how to blacksmith because he'd watch his father. In, in the modern world, we don't quite have that same thing happening. But the reality is that a father has a unique perspective to be able to live an example before his kids, to show Christ to his kids, to put, him, put his kids before himself. In the ancient times, it was that side-by-side -side crafting that developed the next generation of the craftsmen. Today, we want to see the gospel pass from generation to generation, lived out together. We want to see people vibrantly integrated into the church serving side by side 
for the gospel. It's crucial that we see <clears throat> gospel partnerships every day as one gospel minister is not, in, in our church, we should not see like, okay, the elders are going to top down, do one thing. No, we are co-partners, co-laborers with the church. We are called to protect the church. We are called to love the church. We are called to build up the church for the work of ministry. That is the essential aspect of what the church is to do. We release all of us to go out during the week and tell others about Christ. So sending Timothy was his hope. See, Paul wishes to come to them, but he's sending ahead Timothy to go to them as his representative to show the love of Christ to those. In, in other words, this is almost like uh, Paul is being Christ-like by sending Timothy, his very best, to go to be with the Philippians to encourage them. And, and he's going to want them to fix their eyes on Christ. He's going to be, he says, very soon he's going to send to him. So let's pursue the same type of compassion that flows from a heart enthralled with Jesus. Don't serve for admiration of others, but for adoration of the Christ and King. Serve out of compassion for people, not to make a name for yourself. We, we look to humility to seek the good of others in light of how Jesus pours out his life for us. So gospel men, first of all, live out this renewing hope of the gospel and show the love of Christ to the world and people around us. So point two, when we emulate gospel men, joyful love is given. When we emulate gospel men, joyful love is given. Example two is, is Epaphroditus. And I don't know too many people today named Epaphroditus. Maybe you guys know. But Epaphroditus... It says, he said, receive and honor such men, men with Christ's mindset. And, and so here we see Epaphroditus, uh, again, he is Christ-like. So Epaphroditus pursues the interests of others by traveling from Philippi to Rome. Jesus pursued the interests of others by traveling from heaven to earth. Epaphroditus risks his life in verse 30. Jesus gave his life in verse 8. Epaphroditus risks his life to minister to Paul's need, Jesus sacrifices himself to meet our greatest need. So Epaphroditus is, is the second disciple. He, his name literally means devoted to Aphrodite. He probably was a Gentile believer that comes to know Jesus and loves Jesus with his whole life. He's a Gentile believer, and he ends up... the, the the illustration literally is he ends up getting sick probably en route to go visit Paul. He's on his way to go visit Paul. He becomes deathly ill. He gets there, and he has to be nursed back to health. And so there's many times that we see our missionaries that are in peril. We see people who are uh, putting their lives on the lines for the gospel. We should honor such people. We should lift them up in prayer. We should look for ways to serve them and to pray with them and to pray for them. And so he says I, he, he, he receives Epaphroditus and sent to Paul, and now he's sending back to the church to bless the church. And this is the idea of gospel ministry. It's not something that is stagnant, that just is one side receiving or one side giving. It, it, it's a flow, a given flow, as God moves people, as God brings his kingdom to bear on our lives, as God opens up hearts and minds. We want to see fellow brothers and sisters and fellow soldiers. That he uses these terms as brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. You see, he served with Paul for the sake of the gospel, and it cost him dearly. The idea of brother is that Miracle of the gospel, we are adopted. We're children of God, adopted into his family. Isn't that an amazing picture? Adoption is one of those pictures that constantly amazes me. Whenever I see adoption, I have many friends that are adopted. One of my friends would always say uh, that he was uh, a Scottish Asian. <laughs> McGregor, but he was very Asian. 
And, and he, he loved his dad and mom, and, and what a wonderful brother in Christ. But he would just uh, exude how much respect he had for his, his parents. Um, and adoption is one of those things that just shows the love of Christ, shows the gospel in tangible ways. That um, I think of David Platt, who's adopted several people, se- several young kids. He, he and his wife love to see the nations come to know Christ, and he's discipling uh, many uh, from di- several different backgrounds, uh, kids that he's adopted. Adoption's amazing, and it shows the family of God. Coworker, same Lord and mission of the gospel. They drove to, they, it drove them together for the cause of Christ. This is the gospel mandate. And many times you talk to missionaries on the field, you hear that they're on the same page of this is the gospel. We may disagree on these secondary and, and tertiary issues, but the gospel is what changes our hearts and minds, what changes hearts and minds in this culture. We, we need to live as co-workers with those who are preaching the gospel and fellow soldier. See, th- this is one that maybe in our, in our context in the U.S., we think of Christianity more as like a cruise boat, but really we should think of it as a destroyer, right? We, uh, not a destroyer, you know, like a, a battle boat, right? We're, we're on mission, and there's a war. And the war is evident in every aspect. And so Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, we see that there's an armor of God. Like, how are we putting on the armor of God? It all, if you look at it, there's the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness. They're all related to what Christ has done for us. The gospel is what we clothe ourselves with to combat the war that's happening. We allow Christ to be preached and we serve. And so that's the second part. He's your messenger. Um, it's the idea of he's sent on your behalf. And then he's also a, a minister. Where it's, it's, it's actually the word for liturgy, but it actually, Paul's using this as a, a vital worship that's physically seen. And it's useful. He's useful. So Epaphroditus is usefully bringing ministry and sent to Paul with a gift to encourage him. How many times do our missionaries need encouragement on the field? How many times do, should we, and Cynthia does a great job at sending out encouragement on, be, on behalf of the church, but we should think of our missionaries. We have this prayer uh, bulletin every week that we can pray. You can come to prayer time and join in and realize that that's the boiler room of the church as we pray for others. So we lift others up. There's much power in prayer. In fact, our lives are meant to be lived out, not as stagnant followers of Christ that sometimes show up to things, but he says in Romans 12, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, what? As a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So this shows how the gospel changes us to live with a worship mindset, living, looking to Christ in all that we do. So uh, Dia Carson again writes, either we are God-centered and his word and ways are precious to us, then our living is worship to God. If not, we live selfishly, self-centered, in rebellion against God, and nothing we do is actually true worship. So there's two ways to live, right? Either God-centered or self-centered. And we need to ask ourselves, how are we living? This life lived in a gospel-centered worship is impossible. I'm not saying, here, these are five steps to live this way. I'm saying you need God's help. I need God's help. Amen. There's no way apart from that other than Christ doing the work in us and producing that fruit in us. This isn't tied to our salvation in the fact that, oh, I have to do this work to work my salvation. It's tied to the fact that we can't work and God has to work in us to produce it. Amen. What an amazing God we have that does that. Who else has a God that works for them, who serves you, who comes alongside you in your, in your weakness and says, 
in your we when you're weak, what is he? Strong. He's strong. He brings his strength to bear on our weakness. What an amazing Savior we have. Uh, Paul connects Epaphroditus uh, to early church, um, like, uh, church Christ-likeness. Excuse me. He came to Paul modeling this. So you see this in, in humility. He counts others more significant. Jesus did not count himself to be, uh, even though he was equal, he did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to or grasped. And, and so it goes on to say, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary. You see this idea of necessary, of, of completion that is counted because of what Christ has done. See, throughout the years, the church has had many shining examples of selfless, Christ-exalting service. Amen. For instance, historians tell us that in AD 252, a plague hit Carthage, and people were leaving the city in droves because they did not want to be contaminated. They actually lost everything. They just left it and, and left the city. The Christian leader, Cyprian, drew all the Christians to the town center in, in the town that had persecuted them of late and blamed them for the problems, and he told them, fan out throughout the town and give to all according to their need. And they didn't abandon the city in the midst of the plague. See, Christians learn, they earn that reputation of showing charity to all people, regardless of the status or background. And that's what the gospel does. It realizes that we love our city. We love our town. We look for ways to serve our city, our town, our village. We see this in our missionaries, in our church members. We see this lived out in our midst. And, and this is what the, the gospel does. It propels us forward on mission. We say that there is a mission, and we're part of that mission. God's made us part of that mission if we've come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. So Christ minded, he's concerned for them even when sick. He, he gets sick, and he still is looking for others, looking to serve others. And then Paul seeks to increase their joy and decrease their worry by sending him back to them. It's this faithful love that God shows in and through his people. In fact, Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, I think we've read it in Sunday school, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved for us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together in Christ. So by grace, you have been saved. It's that grace alone that saves. May God fill our hearts with gratitude for his rich mercies that come to us each morning in Christ. You know, the funny thing is, this passage is one of these passages that most of the passages in Philippians, you have these life verses that people, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This passage has no one's life verse in it. But you know what? There are life people we should be copying and emulating because of what Christ is doing in them. And this should give us courage because the same gospel that they were living in is the gospel we live in today. And what is the gospel called? It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. The power of God is in our midst. And that should encourage us. That should strengthen us for today and this week and this month and this year. We should see the gospel operating in our hearts in such a way that it overflows into others' lives. <clears throat> so he calls them to receive Epaphroditus and honor such men like these. Jesus says the lowliest of servants, right, in the kingdom is what? The greatest of all. And so we see service different than the world. We see service as loving others. In fact, joy, he mentions joy here. And many times you think about joy, um, it, it's kind of an abstract concept. But I, I love the illustration many pastors have used before. Jesus, others, yourself. So what comes first? Jesus and you serve others, and then self is always last. See, Christ brings joy in the midst of gospel partnerships. There's always in every prayer of mine, he says, Philippians 1.4, always in every prayer of mine, making my prayer with joy. Whenever we see that word joy, we put Jesus, others, yourself. That's what 
brings about the joy in believers' lives. It's the fact that Jesus comes first. And because Jesus comes first, we put others before ourselves. Convinced of this, he goes on in verse 25 of chapter 1, he said, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all in your progress and joy in the faith. He says, complete my joy, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Paul's saying, if your joy is evident, Jesus will be exalted and others will be served, right? This is what is essential to living out of this mission that he's called us to. In fact, honoring is Jesus is valuable and he's treasured above all things. And he gives us a new spirit, a new heart. So we come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. We're built into his church and changed to his likeness as we're connected to Christ and to each other. Mm-hmm. Being in the church is essential for growing in faith. Amen. We, we, he risked his life, so Epaphroditus risked his life, and Paul calls us to risk our lives in the sense that we serve others and worship Christ together as supreme Lord and value. There's these Christ-like connections all over. You know, we see this because the work of Christ to the point of death, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So there's, he's going back to Philippians 2, chapter, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, of that whole view of who Christ is, that having this mindset of yourselves is also in Christ who was in the form of God. He didn't grasp that and hold on to that, but he gave it, gave it up, and he emptied himself, becoming like man. So he's going back to that and saying, these are men that need to be valued because God is working in and through your midst. And we know many men and women that we've seen live this out. And we should live it out too. We should ask for the Spirit to work in our hearts to make us more and more Christ-like, to complete what was lacking in service. You see, the completion of sacrifice that worships Christ in our lives should be seen. In verse 17 in this chapter, he says, even as I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial offering of your faith, I rejoice. Paul was rejoicing even if worship meant end of his life, but making much of Christ. Paul's stance differs from many Christian leaders today who are quickly irritated if someone thinks too little of them. But Paul is fearful here that they would think too much of him and not of Christ. We should emulate leaders that point to Christ in how they live, how they serve, how they joyfully give of themselves, proclaiming the gospel with their very lives. So gospel men live out the hope and love of the gospel, and this builds faith and humbly exalts Christ above all else. And the last point, which we're going to go to the communion here, um, when we emulate gospel men, faith in Christ is seen. When we emulate gospel men, faith in Christ is seen. And so we, as we take communion today, may we see and look to Christ and how he has lived, how he has served, how he has died, and is highly exalted when we live and serve like he did. In his power, and in his purpose, and in his plan, we want to live out the goodness that he has done in our midst. So a church of gospel members shows Christ as Lord more clearly to a watching world that needs joyful faith, hope, and love. So Christ's example, Christ showed the example by laying his life down. He was selfless. He didn't, he emptied himself and he took on our sin and gave us his righteousness. That should give us pause and realize how amazing that is that God himself gave himself up for us. Let's look to Christ together as we um, as we celebrate communion together. I'm going to pray as the men come forward. Lord, we are grateful, we're thankful that the gospel is greater than all of our needs. And I just pray right now that Christ, you would be exalted in our midst as we celebrate what you've done, as we look to the cross and realize that because you paid it all, we can trust you, we can look to you, 
and we can love you as followers of the soon and coming king. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.